Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on our foundation level sample paper discussions. In fact, we are talking about great number of sample questions and not only talking about getting the right answers, but also stepping into the tips, tricks, time management. In fact, the way to best get uh, get them to the right answer is what we are trying to understand. Now it's time for us to step into the next chapter, which is the chapter five test management and looking forward to some questions of this particular set B and trying to answer that. The very first question as a part of this particular session or this particular chapter is question number 30, which of the following best explains a benefit of independent testing? As usual, first try to come up with your answer that what is independent testing, what are the benefits of it, and then try looking at the options. Because sometimes just looking at the options can some you know can be of tricky, like this one. Let's start with option A. The use of an independent test team allows project management to assign responsibility for the quality of the final deliverable to the test team. So ensuring everyone is aware that quality is the test team's overall responsibility. I think we never mentioned that in any of our topic throughout this entire syllabus. In fact, we rather said that we should have quality as everyone's responsibility. Everyone should be responsible to define the quality in the product, not always by testing the system, but at least by contributing to getting that done right so it's just not a testing team responsibility or qa responsibility just because they are independent and that's not a benefit talking about b if a test team external to the organization just can't be afforded then there are distinct benefits in terms of this external team not being so easily swayed away by the delivery concerns of the project management and the need to meet the strict guidelines i think uh sorry the deadlines uh it's, it's pretty important to understand at this point that when you're talking about a highly independent test team, you do have drawbacks of it, considering that you may not share all the detailed information with them, or maybe they will not be able to deliver you what you really expected from them. So having strict guidelines, having strict uh, contract between them, that is the third party organization and you, would lead to a great uh, conclusion. So this is something which is contradicting with that, that the benefit of having an external organization, that they will not be easily swayed, and rather delivery concerns will not be there. They don't have to meet the deadlines. They equally have to meet, and that's not one of the benefit. C, an independent tester team can work totally separately from developers, need not be distracted with changing project requirements. I think I can stop right there, talking about who is that team who's not going to be distracted by changing requirement. Are we talking about developers? Are we talking about testers? Are we talking about the quality assurance team? I'm talking about the release management team or the project management team. I think everyone is impacted by the changing requirements or changing project requirements. So there's no such statement that QAs are, if independent, will not be impacted by changing requirements. They will be. And that's where C also goes wrong. Let's look at D. Of course, that's one right option is what we are expecting. Uh, when specification contain ambiguities and inconsistencies, assumptions are made on their interpretation. And an independent tester can be useful in cautioning those assumptions and the interpretation made by the developer. Totally makes sense. Because we need independent testers to verify or challenge or disapprove those assumptions which were made by a BA or probably a developer while a particular requirement was having ambiguity or missing information. They tried developing it based on their assumption and we need someone else to validate it. My assumptions are always right for me. I need someone else to say that is it right for that person as well. So that makes totally sense. In fact, this is straightforward from the syllabus. If you have been through there, you know, yes, this is going to be the right. So the right answer here is D, when specification contains ambiguities and inconsistencies, assumptions are made on their interpretation and an independent tester can be useful in questioning those assumptions and the inter interpretation made by the developers. Looking at the next question here, question number 31, which of the following task is most likely to be performed by the test manager? 
And these are the K1 level topics, which are very pretty much straightforward, no justification needed, right? Because we did not justify at anything during the syllabus. So we got A, test summary reports based on the information gathered during testing. Yes, test summary reports are something which are written by the test manager, not by the testers. B, review test developed by others. It's the responsibility of tester. C, prepare, the acquire, prepare and acquire test data. Responsibility of the tester. D, analyze, review, and assess requirements, specification, and models for testability. Responsibility of a tester. So, a very straightforward thing. The right answer here is A, write test summary reports and test progress reports are basically the responsibilities of a test manager. Digging up another question from this chapter, which is question number 32. And we are talking about the entry and exit criteria in this question. In fact, they have given you some sample examples of different entry and exit criteria, and they want you to filter them out and collate them together that which one of these are entry and which one of them are exit criteria. Let's start solving from the first one without looking at the option. So number one, it says the original testing budget of $30,000 plus contingency of $7,000 has been spent. Now, when you know the 3,000 was the budget allocated, sorry, 30,000 was the budget allocated to the project for the testing and contingency of 7,000 is already spent. That means you have come to the conclusion and this could not be an entry criteria. If you say that I have allocated this much budget to be used for testing. So the, the single, sing, simple English statements, right, will tell you, is it a present tense, is it a past tense, or is it a past participle kind of thing, right, a future tense and so. So this is a past talking about something which is already done. So one is exit criteria, which is telling you the actuals, right? It is telling you the actuals, not the estimation. So one is exit. Two, 96% of the planned test for the drawing package have been executed and the remaining tests are now out of scope, which straightforward are telling me that 96% test has been executed and the remaining 4% is out of scope. Shall we stop testing? Yes, that could be another example of our exit criteria. Three, the trading performance test environment has been designed, set up and verified. For what? To get started, right? So this is one of the example for entry criteria that the performance environment is now ready to be used for performance testing. So this is number three, is an entry criteria. Four, current status is no outstanding critical defects and two high priority ones, which is telling us that there are no critical outstanding, we can stop testing or we can exit the testing process. The one which are open are just uh, two high priority ones. If that is meeting our expectations or the SLAs, we are good to stop now. And so this is again, number four is exit criteria. Five, the autopilot design specification have been reviewed and reworked. That means ready for use. So that's another entry criteria. And number six, the tax rate calculation component has passed unit testing, which means it is uh, an exit criteria, sorry, entry criteria for integration testing, correct? It, it clearly tells us that uh, the tax rate, which we are talking about is, sorry, the tax rate calculation component has passed unit testing. And thus it is letting us know that it is acting as an entry criteria to integration testing. Past unit testing can certainly be confusing to a certain extent that is it a part of exit criteria for unit testing? Or oh, sure, why not? But the point is, why would I talk about passing about these things? We will have different set of options to declare when the unit testing completes. Now we are talking about a module. I'm talking about a component, which is telling me that we are done with component testing. What's next? So that's where it becomes entry to integration. If you remember one concept there, it also said to you that at any point, if you want, you can merge the exit and entry of two levels and call it as one set of criteria. That means exit criteria of unit testing can be used as 
entry criteria to integration testing. We don't really have to create two, two separate documentation to manage them. And that's where this becomes a very straightforward thing that number six is an entry criteria to integration testing. It does not tell me anywhere that it is to let you know that we have done component testing, right? In order to stop component testing, right? It's a level specific criteria. It's not telling me that can we stop component testing? No. We are telling that the component testing has completed so that the integration testing can begin. That's where it becomes an entry criteria, right? So if I really combine together, one is exit, two is exit, three is entry, four is exit, five is entry, and six is also entry. So the right answer here is D, entry criteria, three, five, six, and exit criteria, one, two, four. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.